So uh, Psalm 73, we are now at book two in the Psalter. Uh, now, you may know that uh, the Psalm breaks down into uh, five books. And so the first two books we've gone through, the first two books are heavy with David's Psalms. If you remember from our last one, Psalm 72, it says the end of David's prayers. That could give you the impression that no more Psalms are there for David, and that's not true. He's going to have Psalms in book three, book four, and book five. But the heaviest concentration of Psalms in the first 72 Psalms were David's. Now we are getting into a series of Psalms, and Asaph is going to write a number of these Psalms. We're going to talk about Asaph. Uh, we're going to talk about his struggles. I will tell you that this is probably my favorite psalm in the Psalter. There are uh, Psalm one twenty one is close. Psalm one thirty one is close, but this one is this one is major. I, I probably have taught more day to day in counseling, teaching, and preaching through the psalm. So I love this. So I hope you're going to love it by the time we're done with it. I want you to think about going through a time of great despair and despondency. So in my counseling about a year ago, I had mentor consultant. He wanted me to try to put my counseling down into one sentence. And, and he says, I, I want you to spell out what you do in counseling. I want you to spell out what you do in teaching in one sentence. And it sounded really easy to me, very honestly. Initially, it's like, you got to be kidding me, one sentence. But then I actually tried to get it into one sentence, and this was not easy at all. And so here's the sentence that I came up with. And uh, the sentence goes this way. I help people where pains from their past or their present is influencing their perspective on life by teaching them about a person, principles and promises, and giving them a pathway for change so that they can have peace, hope, and joy in their lives. Wow. Okay, so I help people, number one. And the people that I help are in pain. The pain is either from their past or their present. It may be pain from the sins that they've done or sins that other people have done, but it's pain from their past or their present that is influencing their perspective, how they see life. It influences that perspective. And then what I do is I teach them about a person, Christ, principles and promises, his word, and give them a pathway for change. Tell them how they can apply the word in their lives so that they can have peace, hope, and joy. All right. So uh, why did I start with that? Because I think this psalm is so important to me because it's all of that. The psalmist is writing and he's trying to help you and he's trying to help me in our despondency and our despair and our struggles. He's trying to help us. And he's talking about his own pain his own misery, his own struggles. And he shares it really honestly and really openly. And that's just so huge. And then he talks about the person of God. He talks about principles and promises. And then he gives us a pathway for change. In fact, when we get to the end, we're going to talk about seven steps out of the despair, seven steps out of the despondency. And at the end, he has peace, hope, and joy again. I hope that's what you're going to hear when we speak tonight. So let's pray. So Lord, tonight, as we come to this passage, I love this passage, you know, and I think probably because I see myself oftentimes in this passage, and I've got to go back and get back into the sanctuary. I got to get back into hearing your words so I can get clarity. I need to place my confidence in you and cling to you and be just so very certain and committed to you. And that's what we, Father, we're living in a broken world. We're living in a world full of pain, full of misery, full of trials, full of troubles. I pray that you would speak to us through this word tonight. And I pray that you're going to be glorified in what we do. In Jesus' matchless name, we pray. Amen. Okay, Psalm 73. Uh, let's look at it, and then we'll try to work our way through it. And this psalm, I entitled it, I Learning Contentment in Difficult and Discouraging Times. I want you to think about that. It's a psalm of Asaph. And just before I read it, I want to tell you that Asaph is a worship leader in the church. And so he was a leader of temple worship. He was a Levitical priest. He was, he was responsible for leading the choir. He's a writer of scripture. He was appointed by King David to this ministry, and he was a spiritually mature man. And this is a man that you would not expect would go through discouragement and despondency. He was a man that loved the Lord. He was in service to the Lord. 
That is who Asaph was. I think another reason why I, I enjoy this psalm is because I think sometimes people think that ministry leaders have it all together <laughs> and that they never have problems and they never have troubles and they never have trials. And that's just not the case. We have a lot of troubles and a lot of trials and a lot of difficulties. And Asaph was one of those leaders. So I want you to think about Asaph, a spiritually mature man, but listen to what he struggled with. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They're not in trouble as others are. They're not stricken like the best of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. They swell out through fatness and their hearts overflow with folly. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against heaven and their tongues strut through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in their riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long, I've been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed a generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. And then I discerned their end. Truly, you've set them on slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes. O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast to you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand and you guide me with your counsel. And afterwards, you will receive me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may faint, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For you behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put to an end everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. So this is the sufficient, eternal, authoritative, life-giving, and life-changing word. So do you ever get to a place where you say, I don't get it? Like Asaph is here. He is at a place where he is really struggling, and he is despondent. He is despairing. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, although the ancient psalmist of Israel were holy men of God who wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they were also deeply human and not above honestly describing their struggles and their temptations, as well as the truths that they discovered and the hopes to which they clung to in order to find victory at last in the grip of God's sovereign and merciful grace. He talked about deeply human. He talked about very honest. He talked about struggles and temptations. He talked about clinging hope. And he talked, to, he talked about a merciful God. And, and that's what I hope you'll see in this psalm. So Asaph is struggling with some type of discouragement. And his discouragement is there. He's feeling despair. Asaph is feeling disillusioned. He is disenchanted with the world that's happening around him. He is depressed. He is discontented. I don't know if any of you have ever struggled with any of that before, but Asaph is struggling with it right now. So let's break this psalm down. There is um, a downward spiral that we're going to look at. So I want you to think first, uh, if we look at the outline, a broad outline, two sections, uh, the first 14 verses are his earthly perspective and he was feelings oriented. So it's an earthly perspective and he's feelings oriented. Then there's an eternal perspective and he's more faith oriented. So first 14 verses, he is on the path downward. And then on the um, upward slide, he is on the path upward. Earthly perspective in the first part, or eternal perspective, feelings oriented in the first perspective, and then he's faith oriented. So let's start to work our way through it. And let's look. 
The opening statement, he makes this opening statement in verse one, and watch what he says. He says, truly, God is good to Israel, to those that are pure in heart. So he makes this opening statement about the character and conduct of God, and he says, God is good, which is a really good place to start. It's really good and remind, to remind ourselves that God is good. I think we live in a world today that has now perverted it, that God is not good. That they look at all the misery and all the pain and the sufferings and the trials, and they say, he can't be good if he's allowing this. And I, I would say that this world would be infinitely worse if God wasn't good and if he took his hands off of us. We have beauty. I was out for a beautiful walk today, a little cold, but a, a beautiful walk today. And as you look around at the creation, there's such beauty in this creation. And there's, even with all the miseries that I could tell you that I have in my own life, there, there are ways that God has been so very good to me. And so I want you to think first, he starts with this opening thesis statement, and he says, God is good. And so this is important because he's going to start with this anchoring piece. Truly, God is good. And who is he good to? God is not only good in his character, but God is good in his conduct. He is good, and then he does good to Israel and to those that are pure in heart. He, he does good to his people. And so this is so important to anchor yourself in the midst of the violent storms that you go through to remind yourself that God is good and that he does good for me, his character and his conduct. But then now Asaph is going to give you a very candid confession. I so appreciate Asaph because Asaph says, well, God is good, but I'm not. Uh, God is sovereign and I want to be in control. God is gracious and I am envious. And he talks really very honestly about himself. And let's look at what he says. He says, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. And he says that I, I want to tell you that I am a, a worship leader in the church. I create scripture, the words that I write, they sing in church, but I struggle and I almost slipped. And he says, he tells you why he says, not only had I slipped, but because I was envious of the arrogant. Asaph recognized that his major problem was envy. And I don't know if you know what envy is, but envy connects to the 10th commandment. How many of you know what the 10th commandment was? You, sh you shall not covet, right? And so you shall not covet. And he talks about neighbors, wives, anything, all these other things. And so it's desiring, coveting is in essence, desiring something that God has not ordained for us to have. Envy is a little bit different. Envy takes it even further. Envy is that it's something that you have that you don't just, I don't think you deserve. So I'm going to try to take it from you. So coveting is I want something, but envy takes it even further. I want to take it from this person because you don't deserve it. So it's displeasure. It's resentment at something else somebody else has, whether it's their goods, material goods, maybe it's their possessions, maybe it's their looks, maybe it's their abilities, whatever it is. We look at something else somebody else has, we say they don't deserve it, and we want to take it from them. That's what envy is. And Asaph is saying, I was envious of the arrogant. Wow. So he is telling you very candid confession. I almost slipped. I almost stumbled. I almost fell away. And he was envious. And then what he does is he talks to you about comparison. The writer, Seven Habits of a Highly Effective Person, uh, Stephen Covey, not a Christian, but he wrote a book, Seven Habits of a Highly Effective Person. And in that book, he talked about five emotional cancers, five things that will destroy you. He talked about compare, uh, competing, contending, criticizing, complaining, but one of the five was comparing. He says that if you compare, it becomes like an emotional cancer in your relationships and you will find yourself destroying your relationships. That is what's going to happen with Asaph. So I want you to see what he does. Watch what he says. He starts with looking at their lives, and he says that the wicked's lives, he's looking at the wicked now. He's got an earthly perspective. And he says the wicked's lives, their lives were problem-free. That's what he thinks. Watch what he says in verses um, three and four. He says, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, and then he says, 
for they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. And it's like, what in the world are you talking about? Pangs and pangs until death. They have no problems in essence until death. They live their lives almost problem-free. They have no problems at all. They, they have such prosperous lives. They seem to get everything that they want. Do you ever think that way? Do you ever look at the people around you? And it seems like that those people that are godless in their lives seem like they're problem free. He goes on in verse five and he says, for they are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. I know some people that have treated their bodies so terribly. I mean, just horrendously. And it's like, I don't know how you've done those drugs. I don't know how you've drunk as much as you have. I don't know how you smoke like a chimney. And you seem to just keep going on year after year after year. And then I know people that would run five miles a day, that would exercise, eat well, and they've got cancer. And it's like, you just don't understand why. So why is it that their lives, who seem to be so godless, seem to be so problem-free, and our lives and the righteous are not? And so Asaph starts and says that their lives seem problem-free, and then he says that they're proud. It says this in verse 6, therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. They swell out through fatness, and their hearts overflow with folly. So pride is their necklace. It's almost like they put on a garment and their garment is a necklace of pride. And so now their lives are not only just problem-free, their lives are proud and they are just so arrogant. And you know, people like this, they're just godless. They're arrogant. Next, I want you to see that they are spoiled. You ever get a spoiled kid? seems like they get everything that they want. Watch what happens here. It says in verse seven, their eyes swell out through, through fatness. Again, once again, he's using this language and he's saying that they, are, they receive everything that they want. Their hearts overflow with folly, that their hearts are constantly talking about what is just wrong and evil, and they are just spoiled. They seem to get everything that they want, and then they just keep talking over and over again. So they are problem-free, they're proud, and they're spoiled. And then he says they're pompous in the way they speak. Watch what he says here in verse eight. They're, they scoff and they speak with malice. Loftily, they, appre- uh, they threaten oppression. So they're just, when they talk, once again, I don't want to demean them, but Hollywood has some people that may be really good actors, but they make these professions of what they think is all of life is. And they think that because they make $40 million a film, that they have the right to tell us what is right and wrong. And they They don't, but they think they do. Basketball stars think that they have the right to tell us politically what we're supposed to do. And it's, you know, they just, because they've received this position, they think that they can speak and they speak with such piety. It's pompous speech and it's a major problem. So they're problem free, they're proud, they're spoiled, they're pompous. And then they come to a place where verse nine, they set their mouths against heaven. And they strut, their tongue struck through the earth. It's one thing to talk politically. It's one thing to talk about earthly things, but now they're starting to speak in a way towards God. And this is what God would want. And this is what God would desire. And I know God and God is happy with me. And this speaking against heaven is just so crazy. And verse 10, therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. This is the struggle because believers are drawn into the world's thinking and believers are drawn into the world speaking and the world speaks. And when believers listen without God's word, they find themselves believing exactly what this world says. And that's a major problem. And Asaph is looking and he's saying, I just don't get this God. These people who hate you are problem free, proud, spoiled, pompous in their speech. And they speak in such a way that even believers are following them. Even believers are trusting them and God, you're doing nothing. I don't get it. And he comes to the place where he says, they even defy you, God. They spit in your face. Watch what they do in verse 11. And they say, how can God know is their knowledge in the most high. They actually say, God doesn't know. And if he does know, if he has the knowledge, what does it matter? He's not going to do anything about it. 
And Asaph is really discouraged because as he's looking from an earthly perspective and his feelings are ramping up, he is struggling with envy. He's looking at their lives and saying, I want their lives and I don't have it. But now Asaph is going to move to another problem. He is going to move to a significant problem. He's going to start by saying that he looks in verse 12 and he says this. He says, behold, these are the wicked always at ease. They increase in riches. He basically summarizes their problems and he says this. I am summarizing them in this way, that their lives are pleasurable, they're prosperous, but they're pompous and they're proud. And that's what the world is. The world he sees is they seem like they're getting all the pleasures. They seem like they speak in such prosperous and pompous ways. They are prosperous, but they're proud. So I I want you to think, how often is it that you find yourself comparing yourself to the world, your neighbor, maybe somebody at work? The guy at work or the woman at work that cheated and is getting advancements is not doing the work that they need to be doing. And I've got to do their work and they're getting advancements and I'm not. I just don't get this, God. How is it this person that can just do such evil things seems like they get over and over blessing upon blessing. And for me as a believer, I struggle. Why is it that the health issues, the material issues, the issues that you struggle with and I all struggle with. And so what we do is we get to a place when we're in that earthly perspective, we will find ourselves envious, but then we may find ourselves self-pitying. And that's what happens here. He goes to constant suffering in verse 13 and 14. So Asaph is going to tell you about this self-pity, his constant suffering. Watch what he says. He says, all in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. So Asaph says, I have kept the integrity of my heart and my hands are innocent. And what does it matter? It doesn't matter. For all day long, I have been stricken. I've been rebuked every morning. Have you ever come to a place where you think your Christian life is just not worth it? Very honestly, I have. I pastor, counselor, you sit there and it's like, God, I, I don't know why my family has had to struggle with the things that we've had to struggle with. I just don't get it. And when I've gotten to that place, I can know that my perspective is off. My perspective is earthly. It's horizontal. And that creates a major problem. Okay, so that's the first half. Whoa, this... But this, he's spiraling. He really is. He is spiraling. And, and what I want you to know is he's spiraling down, but he's going to take some path out. And we're going to start by looking upward, away from the struggles. And I want to give you seven practical steps to conquer your discouragement and discom- uh, discontentment. Seven practical steps. And uh, so we're halfway home. Okay. So in verse 15, he begins his path up. And he starts by ceasing the spiral, which is so important. He ceases the emotional spiral. He ceased it. He said, stop. In essence, he's just telling himself, stop it. And I I have to tell myself that sometimes. James, what are you thinking? And so stop. He ceased the spiral. Watch what he says. He says, if I had said, I will speak thus. I would have betrayed a generation of your children. Watch this. Sometimes in your heart, whether it's envy or self-pity, there's stuff going on in your heart, and sometimes it comes out of your mouth. In fact, I think today we have people that don't care what they say out of their mouths oftentimes. And they say these things and just are so cruel. They say these things to other people. They say these things on Facebook. They say these things in emails. They say these things in in chat and on text lines. They will attack people. Asaph said, wake up. Asaph came to a place where he recognized, I can't say this because I would betray a generation of children. But he said in verse 16, it wasn't over yet. He says, when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task because he he struggled with the envy within, the self-pity that was happening. He knew he couldn't say it to others because he didn't want to trip them up, but he needed to do something about it. So step number one, he ceased the emotional spiral. The only one that's going to stop you 
in your emotional spiral is, is you. I can't stop you. As a counselor, pastor, I can't make you stop. I can give you a pathway for change. I can tell you the principles and promises. I can tell you about the person of Christ, but it is you that's going to take control of your thoughts. It's you that's going to take control of your words and your attitudes and actions. So that's one of the key things. He says, cease. But then he does this. He got into community, which is huge. He went back to church. And what do you mean he went back to church? It's not like he has been out of church. He's been in church. But I will tell you from, once again, being a pastor, sometimes you can do the church thing because you play the role. And then there are times that you are in church. And he went back to church. He went back into community. And when he went back into community, watch what he says here in the verse. He says, until I went into the sanctuary of God. So what happens is he started to focus on his responsibilities to others. And he said, if I say this, I don't want to trip them up. And I don't want to trip them up, God, because the world has been tripping them up. I don't want to trip them up. But then he went into the community and he started to think about his relationship with God and his relationship with others. And it's amazing what worship will do. Worship reorients you. Worship puts God back in the center of your vision. And when God is at the center of your vision, everything starts to, you start to see things more clearly. Remember the perspective on life? So Asaph got back into the community. He heard some good preaching. He heard some good singing and he was really encouraged. And so he ceased the spiral. He got back into community. I would bet you that the vast majority of times when you are struggling with these areas, you don't want to go into the community. So you don't want to go to small group. You don't want to come to the Psalm study. You don't want to go to men's or women's groups, or you don't want to come to church service. Isolation. Isolation. That's right. And the despondency and despair will cause you to go inward and then move you away. And that's exactly what uh, depression wants to do. It wants to move you away. That's exactly where you have to do the opposite. Do the opposite of what you feel. Get into community. That's what Asaph did. So first step, he um, ceased the spiral. Second step, he got into community. Third step, he got clarity. And watch what it says here at the end of verse 17. He says, oh, I missed it. End of verse 17, until that I discerned their end. And then it says in verse 18, truly, you set them on a slippery place. You make them fall into ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes, Oh, Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. And it's almost like that with the rich and these prosperous and pompous people, that in a moment, they think they're very secure, and you have set them on slippery places. It's like you're walking on ice, and you think that you've got it pretty clear, and then all of a sudden, slip, and you're falling down. That's almost what happens with these prosperous, pompous proud people that defy God, the problem-free lives spoiled, defying God, but in a moment, they've gone into their own judgment. And, and Asaph gets clarity. Asaph says, why would I want their prosperity? It's gone. Why would I want their proud lives? Why was I envying these Hollywood stars that are going to be there tonight? Why? And Asaph started to get clarity. He ceased the spiral. He got into community and then he got clarity. He started to wake up to the reality. What's their end? These godless people, what is the end for the godless? They will take their last breath and they will stand before God as their judge, not as their savior, but as their judge. And Asaph says, I was envying them. That, God, my life can be problem full. I could have such pain this side of heaven. And if you gave me 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years of pain, but then you give me an eternity with no pain, why would I transfer? Why would I take what they have for 60, 70, or 80 years and an eternity in hell? Makes no sense. He got clarity. He started to understand their end. And so I, I want you to think about any times that you're struggling with what the wicked seem to be doing. Are you finding yourself thinking on an earthly focus 
or an eternal focus? Are you thinking about feelings? Or are you talking about faith? So Asaph ceased the spiral. He got into community. He got clarity. The third thing he did was this. He found himself needing to confess and repent, which is interesting because Asaph, I'll tell you when he talked about his envy in the beginning, this is him going back and reminding himself and doing a review. But when he was in the midst of the spiral, he didn't realize it was envy. He didn't realize he was struggling with self-pity. What he only focused on was their sin. But Asaph now got into, and he realized this, he said this, when, I lost my verse, when my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast to you. You ever find yourself despondent and despairing, and now you're starting to get angry with God? thinking that God should have done something different. God, I can't believe you've given me this. I can't believe it. And all the complaints and the criticisms, all those things that we do with like the nation of Israel, God has given us freedom and we want to go back to Egypt. God has given us manna and we want something else. God has given us quail. We want something else. God has given us a promised land. We said, we're not ready. We just like the nation of Israel because that's us. We don't like what God has given us. And then we blame God. And these people do that. And and Asaph says, I did that, God. I was so focused on this earthly people and envious. I was desiring them rather than desiring you. I wanted their lives rather than the life you gave me. I wanted their eternity rather than the eternity that you gave me. I was embittered. I was pricked. I was brutish. I was ignorant. I was like an animal to you, God. By God's grace, I've never gotten to the place where I hated God. God has kept me from that. But there are times that I sit there and it's like, God, I'm not happy with his sovereignty. <laughs> I'm not happy with his providence. I'll sit there and complain. And it's like, James, yes, okay, Lord, I hear you, but I don't like this. And it's okay to say you don't like it, but it's another thing to say, I think I have a better plan, God. That's where Asaph was. Asaph got embittered. And so he needed to confess, and confession is so important. Write this passage down. I didn't give it to you. I didn't write it down on the PowerPoint. Proverbs 28, 13. And it says, he who conceals his sin, Proverbs 28, 13. He who conceals his sin will not prosper, but he who confesses and in forsakes it finds mercy. So he came to a place where he confessed. He says, I'm done. I can't do this. And confession means I agree with you, God, and repentance means I go the opposite direction. Okay, so now he needed to come to a place where he placed his confidence in God and he clung to God. Watch what it says here in verses 23 through 25, 23 to 25. He says, nevertheless, I am continually with you. I love that. That God, I am right here with you. I'm not leaving you. And then he recognizes, but I'm not leaving you because really you're not leaving me. You hold my right hand. Just as much as I want to cling to God, God is saying, I've got you, James. And when you fall and you get earthly in your perspective and you start to get envious and self-pitying and all these things that you can struggle with, James, I got you. And he's got you as well. I'm continually with you. I hold you by my right hand. He says this, you guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will receive me into glory. I, I want you to hear the beauty of this. Watch this in verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And I have no one on earth I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God, you're the strength of my heart and of my portion forever. This He is so clinging so much. He has placed his confidence back in God. His vision has now gone upward. His vision is about God clinging to me. I'm clinging to you. And that is changing his perspective radically. So he ceased the spiral. He got back into community. He got clarity. He confessed his sins. He, he placed his confidence in God. He's clinging to God. Oh, what an amazing change that has happened in Asaph's life. Asaph was on a spiral down, but now he is on this pathward up, and he's given us these steps. So he's given us five steps. Now we've got two more that we need to think about. He was counseled by the Holy Spirit. He was counseled by God. Some people 
come to me for counsel. But I often say that the person that you really need to counsel with is daily sessions with the Holy Spirit. That we do need earthly people to mentor us and disciple us and work through with us. But the person, the real counselor is not James Long. The real counselor is the Holy Spirit taking God's word in his hands, in your hands, and working in your heart to change you radically. And so he's watched with the verses, you guide me with your counsel. And afterwards, you will receive me into glory. What a beautiful word that God is going to counsel you by his word, and then he's going to take you. He's going to counsel you all the way to glory. His last step is also important. Asaph committed his way to God. He committed his way. Watch the final verses here. He says, my flesh and my heart may fail. Asaph recognized that I, I sin. My body's breaking down, which it is, but my heart will often fail. But God, you're the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far off from you shall perish. Now he's getting that perspective again, eternal perspective. You put an end to everyone who was unfaithful to you. But then he says, watch in verse 28, but as for me, it is what? Good to be near God. Remember where he started this? God is what? Good. And he ends it with, it is good to be near you. I've made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. So I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the gospel. I want you to think about the gospel in this passage, because um, he starts, and let's go back to verse 23. And he says this, watch what he says, because justification is where you are saved, the initial part of your salvation. And he's saying, in essence, God, you saved me. You brought me to yourself. You uphold me. Watch what he says in verse 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. It's in essence saying, God, you, you saved me. You are holding me. You brought me to yourself. You brought me into a relationship with you, and you're holding me. That's what real salvation is. That's what happens with justification. God declares you not guilty. He brings you into a saving relationship, and he says, I'm going to hold you until eternity. So justification. Sanctification. Next verse. You guide me, verse 24, you guide me with your counsel. So throughout his life, throughout your life as a Christian, you start the Christian life with justified. God has saved you and brought you into a relationship. And then for the rest of your Christian life, he is guiding you with his, his counsel. He is growing you through the word so that you become more like him. And then glorification. He takes you to heaven. You receive me into glory. Your salvation right there. Asaph is in essence saying, I'm stopping the envy. I'm stopping the self-pity because he went back to the gospel that he knew at the time. You and I know a great, much greater about the gospel than he did. We know that we're justified because Christ lived a perfect and righteous life, died for us, took our envy and our self-pity upon himself, took the wrath of God upon him for our sin, lived a perfect life, died a substitutionary death, rose victoriously, is in heaven right now, ascended and is in heaven right now, interceding, and he will return as the reigning king. We know that. Asaph only knew a portion of that, but Asaph says, you saved me, you were sanctifying me, and you're going to take me to... I wonder if you're struggling with despondency and discouragement, have you found yourself thinking on an earthly level, number one? Have you been driven by your feelings, number two? And have you found yourself forgetting about the eternal perspective and about faith in God? Remind yourself of the person of God. Remind yourself of the principles and promises and put yourself back on the pathway of change. And maybe these seven steps are part of the pathway that will get you out of this. God wants to do something amazing in your life. So what you see today just doesn't make sense. I get it. It doesn't make sense to me at times, but we have a God who makes sense out of all of it. He says, I can bring beauty out of ashes. I want you to remind yourself of uh, Good Friday. We call it Good Friday. Why? I don't know. I guess we call it Good Friday because Jesus Christ, Christ, Christ lived and died for us. But we only call it Good Friday 
because of the perspective of Sunday. I bet you none of the disciples were sitting there on Friday night saying, well, this has been a good Friday. And they weren't thinking on Saturday, been a really good Saturday. And even on Sunday, they were puzzled. But then when they saw their risen king, it now becomes a good Friday. Their perspective changed. So I help people where pains from their past to their present is influencing their perspective on life by teaching them about a person, principles and promises, and giving them a pathway for change so that they can have peace, hope, and joy. That's my job, but that's your job as well. All of us are supposed to be in that same job. Help people. And a lot of people are in pain. Teach people about Christ, the person. Teach people about principles and promises. Give them a pathway for change. And see not only peace, hope, and joy in your life, but see renewal of peace, hope, and joy in their lives. It's so exciting. It really is. It's hopeful. So let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are good. You're not only good in character, but you're good in conduct. You do good for us when we don't deserve it. Father, I praise you for that. I thank you for the honesty that Asaph had. This spiritual leader was willing to be honest and saying, I struggle with self-pity and I struggle with envy. My perspective has been off because I've been thinking about this earth and I've been think driven by my feelings. Lord, please forgive me. And then Asaph started to think and he got out of the spiral and he got out of the spiral because he started to think about others instead of himself. And he got into community and he saw clarity more and he got to a place where he confessed and he clung to you. He placed his confidence in you and he was counseled by you and he committed his way to you. Lord, I pray that more than just seven steps on a piece of paper, I pray that these would be practical applications in our lives. So do a work in us, Father, and then do a work through us. I thank you for healing. I thank you for love. I thank you for your faithfulness in the midst of our unfaithfulness. I thank you for the good news of the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.